A very good morning to you from First Presbyterian Church of Tequesta. I'm Pastor Kathy Dane, the transitional minister here, and we're very happy to have you join us here this morning. Today is Leaders Sunday, and we're looking forward to having leaders from our deacons and our elders leading in worship. Along with that is Millie Eington, who is a member of our transition team and is going to share a little bit about our transition process. Thank you, Kathy. So I am one of six members of the transition team, uh, which has been meeting with the goal of taking the temperature of our church, um, what our current congregation, uh, what our strengths and weaknesses are, and what we want the vision of our church to be in the future. So we are asking you, our members, to take part in a survey called the Congregational Assessment Tool. Um, it was created by a nationally respected consulting organization for churches called Holy Cow. Um, so this survey is going to help us see where we're at as a church now and where we want to go so that we can have information to provide to the pastor nominating committee um, to find the pastor that is that God is calling for our congregation at this time. So you'll be receiving in the next two weeks, within the next two weeks, you'll be receiving a link to complete this survey, the congregational assessment tool. Um, so we do ask that you guys take that so that your voice can be heard um, and shape the future of our church. Um, this survey is going to take you about 30 minutes, so we ask that you sit down with enough time to really mindfully answer these questions when you receive that link. And if you would prefer to take it in person on paper, we'll have stations set up on April 3rd, Sunday, April 3rd, um, for you to take it here in person, or you can grab a paper copy from the office on any weekday. So thank you for participating in that, and we're excited to see where we go in the future. Anything Thank else? Thank you very much, Millie. No, that's great. Beloved, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare for worship.
Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see everyone here in worship uh, this morning. Whether you are joining us in person or online, it is very good to have you here with us this morning. Uh, you may notice I'm out of uniform today. And uh, that's because today is Leaders Sunday, and so uh, we are blessed to have members of our deacons and elders and committees sharing in the worship service um, this morning. It is a reaffirmation that we are a priesthood of believers, every, each and every one of us, the priesthood of believers. And so I'm really looking forward to joining you down there and enjoying the service this morning. A few announcements in which to share with you first. Um, our C.S. Lewis class um, is continuing on Wednesdays. We have our dinner at 6.30 and then the book study at 7. And some of you might say, why are we teaching this class, Kathy? Why? 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 But I think you'll find, um, if you are able to join us, that um, it is an enjoyable time and has been offering some great discussion as we make our way to the outskirts of heaven in the great divorce. Now, I know that there's a lot going on in the life of our congregation, and one of those has been the work of our transition team. And so I'd like to invite Millie Einton, who's a member of our transition team, forward to share an update. Thank you, Kathy. Um, hi, again, I'm Millie Eyington. I am one of six members of our transition team. And the goal of the transition team is really to take the temperature of our church, see where we're at as a congregation right now, what are our strengths, what are our opportunities for growth, and where do we, as the, the members of the church, want our church to go in the future? So we are the, the first way that we're going to really do that is by sending out a survey. And you guys might have gotten something in the mail um, explaining this survey. It's called the Congregational Assessment Tool, and it was created by Holy Cow, which is a consulting firm that is, is nationally respected for church organizational type surveys like this. So you'll be receiving that survey within the next two weeks. Um, and we really encourage you and everyone, all of the adults and young adults in your household to complete this survey. Um, and once we get the results, we will be able to share those with, we'll, we'll analyze them and share them with the pastor nominating committee um, to hopefully find the pastor that God is calling to our congregation. Um, one thing I wanna point out is this survey is gonna take you about 30 minutes to complete. So we ask that you do sit down at a time that you can really mindfully answer these questions. Um, and it's going to be a, a really great way to share your voice and your vision and be able to help shape the future of our church. So thank you in advance for your participation. And if you have questions, you can ask me or Kathy or anyone from the transition team. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Millie. And um, for those of you who may not be comfortable filling it out online, um, we will have some stations set up in two weeks on April 3rd where you can meet with one of the members of the transition team and, and complete the survey. So that is great. Another great thing that is happening is we are raising funds for our youth ministry, and I'd like Crystal to share a little bit about that. Good morning, my name is Crystal Botha. I'm the Director of Family Ministries here. So I'd like to just take a few minutes to um, let you know that this month is Scholarship Emphasis Month. So we are currently raising funds. We kicked it off with our bake sale, which was a lot of fun. Thank you for everyone who participated, either baking goods or partaking all the goodies that were made. Um, and then throughout the month, you're going to be hearing from some of our past scholarship recipients. Um, we have currently have two ways to give. We have the Zakara Camp Scholarship. This provides opportunities for our young people to go on summer mission trips and things of that nature. Um, we also have the Academic Scholarship, which provides learning enhancement for our uh, graduating seniors as well as current college students. 
students. So you'll see in your pews, there is a yellow scholarship fund giving envelope. If you could please designate where you want those funds to go specifically, either camp or academic. In addition to this, if you could please remember on all your giving checks to specify First Presbyterian Church of Tequesta, not FPC, uh, for banking purposes. Um, one other quick announcement. Um, this is the season of Lent, and we are currently underway with our bunny drive. So if you would like to purchase stuffed animals, we will be delivering the stuffed animals to the patients at St. Mary's Children's Hospital um, April 12th. And please remember to get those stuffed animals that have the sewn on eyes, not the buttons. And they do need to be brand new. Thank you. Thank you very much, Crystal. Beloved, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Drew and I'm a deacon with the church. Please join me for the call to worship. Come to the Lord, whose love is better than life. The one who satisfies, sustains, and supports. Come to worship, to think, to spend these moments. When together we honor God, who is all Come sing to God, O living saints, sing praises to God's name. You are God forevermore. Our lives shall sing your praise. Please continue standing for our opening hymn, 10,000 Reasons, as shown on the screen.
for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ian Eyington. I've been a, a member of this church for about 20 years. I'm currently a deacon, and I'm also on the nominating committee, which is different from the, the pastor nominating committee. Um, so if you or someone you know wants to get involved at a larger level than where you currently are, please get with me and we can discuss. Uh, but for now, let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge that we are sinners. We are sorry for thinking that our plans are better than your plans for us. And we apologize for the many distractions that steal the time and adoration in our hearts that we should dedicate to you. Thank you that even in our sinful nature, you died for us that we may live forever with you. Please remind us to choose you every day and honor you with all we say and do. Amen. Please join us for the Gloria Patri. As God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord and Savior, Savior be with you. And also with you. Let us now share the peace with one another. Good morning, everyone. My name, my name is Suzanne Meckler. I am a deacon here as well, and this is my son. Hello. <laughs> Ryder Meckler. Um, and we're going to do the children's sermon today. So can I have all the children come up to the first row? All right. Sit where, how about we just sit right here? Yeah. All right. All right. Do you guys know what these are? School pictures, right? But these aren't my kids, are they? I mean, you've pretty much seen this guy. <laughs> Scoot over, please. Thank you. So these are my neighbors. This is Christina and Caitlin, and they've been living um, next door to us for nine years now. And this is when they moved in, because I keep these pictures on my fridge, because now they're 16 and 17. And they're growing up. So I try to remember the way they were when we first met them. Um, but they're one of our best friends. And so one of the themes that we're going to talk about today is love thy neighbor. But it's more than that. It's love thy neighbor as thyself, right? And I want to go into that a little bit. So do you guys know what a neighbor is? What? Uh, it's somebody who lives, like, right next to you. Right next to you. And do you guys know your neighbors? Yeah. yeah? Any good ones? Yeah. If they're bad, I don't want to hear them. Okay. Ava. Ava? She's a She's a good neighbor. 
Yeah, it's good to have good neighbors. And when Ryder and I were talking about this the other day, I said, well, how do we show we love our neighbors? And he goes, we go trick or treating. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure that's the way it counts, but we're going to try to do it every day of the year. So do you guys know who this is? I'm asking the kids. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to do this one. Do you know who this is? Daniel's tiger. I bet he might know who this is. <laughs> so um, I, I, I associate this with the avatar, all right, of Mr. Rogers. So Mr. Rogers was uh, around when I was a kid growing up, and he had this show where he would come in and he would get dressed and he would sing this song. Um, you probably have heard it. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yep, okay. So he would sing this song, and he would, for some reason, put his shoes on every time and sing. Never, <laughs> I don't know, it's just his thing. It was very nice. Um, but the, the show was all about really loving other people, but also loving yourself, right? And so when, when we talk about this uh, scripture, which we're going to talk about today, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. So you got to love the Lord and then love your neighbor as yourself. But that's saying you got to love yourself and then also love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So respect everybody. I um, want you guys to, Ryder, can you come up first? Um, so Mr. Rogers also wrote a couple of really cool poems that I love. And so Ryder's going to read one uh, titled Walking Giraffe. I love to take my giraffe for a walk. He's taller than anyone else I know. You're welcome to talk with my tall giraffe. He's kind from his head to his toe. So step up to and speak to my pet giraffe. He'll talk to us down here below. <laughs> Very good. All right, would you like to read one? All right, how about Are You Brave? Are you brave and don't know it? Are you brave and can't tell? Are you brave and just don't show it? Well, others know it very well. Are you brave and you wonder? Are you brave and you doubt? Are you brave above and under, especially when you're inside out? Tell me, won't you tell me? Tell me, are you brave? All right, you want to read one? All right, this is the last one. It's called, It's You I Like. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair, but it's you I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you. Not the things that hide you, not your toys, they're just beside you. But it's you I like, every part of your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you'll remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you yourself, it's you, it's you I like. So what do you hear in some of those poems? What do they talk about? Being kind. Being kind. Giraffes are kind. <laughs> Giraffes are kind and apparently they listen well, right? Okay. Maybe acceptance. Yes, everybody can be accepted and you should be accepted, yeah? Love yourself. Love yourself. All right, very good. So what I get out of a lot of the work that Mr. Rogers did is, is a couple of things. One, you got to kind of like rock just who you are. Right? I mean, Ryder, I said this to Ryder this morning, and he decided that he wanted to rock wearing a Christmas hat today. Hard for me to argue when I just told him to rock himself. So um, feel what you feel, and that means that if you're sad, it's OK to be sad. If you're happy, it's OK to be happy. And if you're mad, so if you're mad, tell somebody, talk to somebody, and explain why you're mad. Right? Because you're allowed to talk about it. Now, what you don't want to do is get mad and then just be upset and lash out on somebody when they don't know why you're mad, right? And so if you're mad, tell somebody you're mad, especially somebody that you love very much, okay? And then the last thing is that God created you, and he created each of you to be who you are, right? That makes you special. You're not like anybody else, right? And so you should be very proud of who you are and the fact that God created you to be who you are. And so with that, anybody want to give a prayer? Okay. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the food we eat, the drinks we drink, the schools we go to, the churches we have, and the homes we live in. 
Thank you for our family, friends, and teachers. Thank you for making us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jim Snyder. I'm an elder here and a member of the transition team. And this is the first reading from Exodus chapter 20, verses one to 17, otherwise known as the 10 Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of their parents, to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not co covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So, brothers and sisters, let's quiet our minds now as we unite uh, in the prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, as we sit here on this warm, sunny Sunday morning, slowly breathing in the dark, we look for your light. Please send your spirit as we slowly breathe in your peace and love. Lord, we hear your command to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, <clears throat> and with all our strength as we now bring our prayers and concerns. Most gracious Father, we ask for peace in Ukraine and an end to the bombings and needless loss of life. We sit helpless as families are torn apart by a campaign that has nothing to do with peace. Lord, we sit helpless as we watch people being oppressed, captured and enslaved, forced to work just to produce more profit for those in power. Lord, we lift them up in prayer that they might find peace as you walk with them through their pain. Heavenly Father, we also lift up the leaders of the world who continue to pray on the weak and innocent that you may give them a new understanding of how to lead people in the world. Lord, hear our prayers. 
We lift up your children who continue to grieve over the loss of a loved one, who did not get a chance to say goodbye, or who sat helplessly watching someone slowly drift away. We lift them up to you that you might find, that they might find relief even for a moment when the wave of grief appears to be more than they can handle. Lord, comfort them and remind them that they are not alone. We continue to pray for Brian Yeager, Jim and Mary, Muff and Lynn, Vivian and Judy. Lord, hear our prayers. We lift up our brothers and sisters who are suffering from health conditions, who are facing the fear of a scheduled medical procedure, or those who are recovering from a current visit to the hospital. We ask for comfort and guidance as life may have changed permanently and the world will never be the same. We ask for comfort from the overwhelming anxiety and fear. Lord, we lift up Connie Wright, who's just gone into hospice care. Lord, hear our prayers. We lift up those who are experiencing distance and strain in their relationships. We ask for peace and guidance as we learn how to hear and communicate with our loved ones. Lord, hear our prayers. Most gracious, caring, and fa Father, we bring to you the children in the world who are suffering from neglect and abuse. We ask that you lead us, your hands and feet, to help guide these children to safety in places like the Baby Havens in South Africa, the Real Life Children's Ranch, and Family Promise. We ask that the food collected and delivered to Palm Beach County Food Project and Edna Runner nourish families both physically and spiritually. Lord, we lift up all of these prayers to you as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Wood, and I'm a deacon, and I'm on two or three committees and the board of directors of the Church Foundation at this time. Uh, look around you. The beauty of uh, this church and the sanctuary itself, a safe place where our children can grow in the assurance of our Savior, and all of us can share in Christian fellowship. Everything we have is a gift from God, so let us remain, return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please stand for him, uh, number 280, Amazing Grace. just join me in a quick moment of prayer. Lord, uh, I ask that as we sit here today, that you open our hearts and our minds to hear your voice speaking to us through your scriptures, through the Holy Spirit, and through the words that I speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, my name is Jocelyn O'Neill, and I am your session elder for the Family Ministries Committee. And uh, we'll start with uh, our first gospel reading with Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now Jesus went on to tell that man that he had answered correctly, and that if he did those two things, he would live, and I'm sure Jesus was talking about eternal life. Uh, the next one I wanted to read was Romans chapter 6, verse 23. 
For the wages of sin is death. Period. I'm going to stop right there. The wages of sin is death. Our God is a God of grace, but he is also a God of order. Have you ever stopped to consider the miracle of the human body? It is almost unfathomable to imagine how I could be standing here today. I started off as two tiny little cells, a little bit of water, some protein, and some DNA. And now I'm standing here today, and I'm able to think, I'm able to act, and I am able to understand that I am alive. Imagine all the things that had to go absolutely perfectly for that to happen. Sometimes I go stand by the ocean and look up at the stars on a clear night. And I think about how incredibly small and insignificant I am. But then I also think about how I'm part of something so much bigger. It might look like chaos to us. But it is all ordered, and it works according to the way that God intended. There is a price, however, if you decide to break this order or this law. The natural law of gravity, for instance. It's there so we don't all float away into space, right? However, if you decide to step off a building, you will fall. There's no maybe there. It's going to happen. And if that building is tall enough, you will likely die from your tragic error in judgment. There's two certainties in our life, right? Death and taxes, that's it. <laughs> Naturally, we all die in the end. And there's no maybe about that either. We also have to follow human laws like traffic laws. If we fail to follow those laws, we might end up in an accident. And if that accident is severe enough, we could die from it. And just like there are natural laws and human laws, there are also spiritual laws. And God was kind enough to give us those laws so that we would know when we broke them. You can find 10 of them in Exodus chapter 20, and we know them as the Ten Commandments. This is the spiritual order of things. And just like the law of gravity, it never changes. And if you break these spiritual laws, it will also cost you your life. Yes, friends, this sermon is about sin, so buckle up. It is an ugly word and one we don't like saying on Sunday mornings. But sin is the whole reason that we have Easter. Sin is the breaking of any one of God's spiritual laws. It means a violation of God's order in our lives, and breaking those spiritual laws has the same effect as breaking the law of gravity. Your tragic error in judgment will cost you your life. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Sin breaks our relationships. Relationship with God. Relationship with others that we love relationship with ourselves. Sin causes death in these relationships. Sometimes it's just a little bit. Sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes it happens just a little bit at a time, so you don't even notice until it's become something big. Our sin causes a series of obstacles that prevent us from receiving God's grace. Our sin might not always show on the outside, but it is there in our secret place, and it will surely find us out in the end. Because, friends, there are no secrets from God. This, I don't know if you guys can see it in the back, but this is my little treasure box of my sin. I keep it locked away in a dark place. How many of you enjoy it when someone comes into your life and tells you what to do? None of us, right? None of us want to have someone else control our lives because certainly we know best. But that type of rebellion kills three different relationships. First, our relationship with God. 
Either we are afraid that God will be mad at us, or we just don't believe that we need him in the first place. The day I turned away from God was the day after my daughter Brenna was born. It was a high-risk pregnancy because of my age, and I had gestational diabetes. I tried hard to take care of myself. In fact, I was doing those prenatals before I ever even got pregnant, just in case. On the day she was born, Brenna came out all pink and screaming, and she was beautiful and perfect, or so we thought. Remember all those things that had to go just right with those two little cells? I spoke with a doctor on the phone that I had never met at 4.30 in the morning, and she told me that my baby had imperforate anus, and I had never even heard of such a thing. It turns out that she also had a tethered spinal cord and scoliosis. The next two years were grueling with multiple surgeries, therapies, colostomy bags. It was my own personal hell. These congenital birth defects were part of a larger syndrome, and I came to understand that this syndrome and these defects often occurred within the first three to four weeks after conception, the time when all the major organs are just beginning to form off the common core. The theory is that while genetics may play a factor, they think it is often an environmental cause, as in something wrong with the host, the mother. During that exact time, I became ill with the flu, and I resisted going to the doctor to get medication because I was afraid it would hurt my baby. I hope you can see where this is headed, right? Guilt, shame. I didn't know that my inactions may have caused all of these problems for her. Oh yeah, and let's not forget anger. How could God have let me get sick? How could God let this happen to my baby? It was a long time before he and I talked again. The second relationship that we can break is our relationship with ourselves. We know what's right and wrong. You immediately know because either you feel joy or you feel guilt, shame, worry, fear, doubt. It keeps us from knowing ourselves and who God wants us to be. Sins against ourselves can be negative self-talk, poor food choices, or anything else that we do to hold ourselves back from becoming our best selves and following God's will in our lives. The last relationship is our relationship with others. Our human history is a long and sad story of destruction of our relationships through war, murder, slavery, civil rights. Because we can't relate to God, we can't relate to each other. And as a young parent, I found myself overwhelmed, anxious, and depressed. I didn't realize until much later that I was suffering from mental illness and that I needed help. While I was trying to cope on my own, I became an angry mother. I never wanted to be this mother. I always wanted to be the kind and caring mother that guided her children and always let them know that they were loved. But my mental illness made it, me incapable of being of what I wanted to be, and I sinned against my children every day. And it is still affecting our relationship today. So as you can see, sin causes death in my life, and it does in yours as well. But all we have to do to avoid this death is to follow some pretty simple rules. God's law, right? The Ten Commandments basically tell us how to be good people. Only worship God, don't kill people, don't steal, honor your parents, and so forth, right? But apparently, that's just too hard for we humans to do. The Israelites wandered around in the desert for 40 years because they couldn't figure out how to worship just one God and stop complaining. When they finally got their stuff together enough to make it into the promised land, they still couldn't get it right. 
false gods again, along with a myriad of other sins to boot. So they just kept getting invaded and exiled and invaded and exiled over and over again. They would get into a bad spot and call out to God for redemption, and they would repent, and they'd say, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. God would forgive and rescue them, only for them to turn around and do it again. Our old friend, Gene Mayer, used to say that he couldn't worship the God of the Old Testament because he was an angry and vengeful God. I don't think that's true at all. The God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. He is an incredibly patient father. He gave instructions, the Ten Commandments, and their consequences up front. It's laid out right there. He told them what would happen if they broke the rules. And then they broke them, and consequences happened. And yes, sometimes people died as a result. I'm sure that after about the eighth time of forgiving and bailing them out, only to have them mess it up again, that he got a little frustrated and angry, and justifiably so, right? He's looking down going, seriously? You did that again? You know there are consequences. We have been through this before. How many times do I have to tell you not to do that? Does that sound like me talking to my kids? Well, he is our father, and we are his children. And I don't care how old you are, you are still a child compared to God. We're, we're his kids, and we are always mucking it up. The Old Testament continues this cycle with prophets sent to warn the sinners. The sinners don't listen until something bad happens, and then they blame, they blame the prophet for not telling them. Anyway, it becomes apparent that the children of God are just not going to ever figure this out for more than one generation at a time. So, to end this terrible cycle, God sent his only son. He came, a, he came to show us the way. He spoke truth to us. And then he gave us everlasting life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He took those Ten Commandments and he dumbed them down even more for us. And he said, love your God with everything you are, the only God, and love others the way that you love yourself. Basically, do these two things to be a good person and live in God's grace. But he knew we couldn't do that either. So, he made the ultimate sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you may remember how they uh, built altars and um, sacrificed bulls, lambs, goats, birds. These sacrifices were to pay the wage of their sin, death. The animals paid the price for the humans, Humans had to make the sacrifices to make themselves clean again and free from sin. Jesus is called the Lamb of God because he became that sacrifice that cleansed us of sin for all time. None of us ever have to pay the sin debt because he paid it in full. Some of us think we may have to pay for it or earn our forgiveness or grace from God, but we just can't. Grace can't be earned. It can only be given and received. In three days, Jesus wiped away the consequences of sin for all people for all time. He died, he went to hell, he paid that debt in person, and then he walked out. Because, he, because death couldn't hold him. And death can't hold us either anymore because our debt was paid that day. And now we can have eternal life, but we can only have it if we accept the gift of his grace.
As long as we accept the gift of God's grace, we will be saved from death and have eternal life. End of story. But what good is a gift if we never use it? This is not a cheap gift. It was expensive. It cost God his son, his only son, his child. God's only son had to die a horrible death so that we can enjoy life. Imagine if Jesus was standing here with us now and we had to watch him be crucified. I think about it all the time. Would I have been able to stand there knowing he was dying because of something I did? I know I would not be able to sacrifice one of my children even for the sake of the world. This gift isn't cheap. This picture, can everybody see it? Do I need to move it? Okay. This picture was uh, painted by my daughter, uh, Brenna, about four years ago or so. Um, and it, she, she painted it to be one of the stations of the cross. I'm sorry, I'm going to come down here. She painted it to be one of the stations of the cross for a Good Friday service, and um, it must have been spring break because I, I came home from work, and she had started painting it, and all that she had so far was this giant cross and the outline of Jesus, and he was all black, and his hair was hanging in his face, and this was, it was, it was dark. I was a little worried about my daughter. Um, <laughs> but when I looked at it, I, it felt wrong and evil. And what I realize now is that what I was looking at was sin and the sin that Jesus was carrying that day because he took it all. And it was wrong and it was evil and it was awful to look at. But now you can see here we've got these, these vines with flowers. And look, they're, they start up here in his crown of thorns, and they flow out, and they cover all, all the people who were watching that day. It's his grace. It's his love washing away their sins. And that was... Um, Pretty impactful for us um, as parents when we saw that beautiful daughter, that imperfect beautiful daughter that we had raised, make that present for us, make this painting. Grace, all we have to do is accept it, but something that precious that cost so much, how can we possibly take it and put it on a shelf and never use it? We dishonor the gift if we don't use it. Faith without works is cheap grace. If we accept it, we have to do something with it. The title of this talk is A Lot Can Happen in Three Days. And a lot did happen in three days, the salvation of the entire world for one, but also my salvation your salvation. A lot can happen in three days. And I would like to take this opportunity while I have you as a captive audience to invite you to find out what can happen for you personally and your relationship with God in three days. Our Great Banquet Weekends are starting up again this fall in November and they are 72 hours, three days. I don't think that's a coincidence. A lot can happen in three days. Think about it. 
I will leave you with this one final thought from Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But, there's a big old but in there. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and de glorious. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sat upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, At the Cross, as shown on the screen.
May God's gift of grace light your path and your faith guide your good works in God's will. Amen.